everybody. Welcome back to another Steady Wealth podcast. One of the themes that we have been uh, talking about now, probably for the past nine to maybe 12 months or so, is, is this idea that we might be in for a higher inflationary environment for a longer period of time. Uh, we're not in the camp of sort of the 10%, but just you know something higher than the one to 2% we've been in and how that ultimately we think is uh, going to dictate sort of portfolio allocation going forward. We know a lot of people are absolutely not allocated this way. And so we think it's important to kind of think this through, hear out different points of view. And you know, my job uh, during the week uh, includes a lot of conversations with, with smart institutional investors. We try to pull, uh, poke holes into this idea. And uh, one gentleman that I was fortunate enough to be introduced to just recently comes from Vanek. This is a one of the big ETF providers. Uh, Dave Schassler, how are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to the show. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask you, if you don't mind, to introduce yourself. But no, you and I have had a chance to quickly catch up a few days ago. Uh, I think you and I are both of a similar view. Uh, again, you know, poking holes into this idea of where we could be wrong about it is always good. So um, if you just give us a quick introduction and then we'll we'll dig right into it. Yeah. So Dave Schassler, I work at Vanek. We're in New York City. We are a global firm. I'm a head of a group called Multi-Asset Solutions. R really simply, we look at quantitative and fundamental data and apply it to every asset class. Um, look at lots and lots of data. We look at history. We are studies and students of history. If we can understand history, we can start to think about today. We can start to position ourselves for tomorrow, and that's effectively what we do. So lots of views on inflation, lots of views on the current market and how to be invested. And I think just for, for viewers uh, sort of understanding, you know, one of the things that the, the retail investors challenges is that the source of, of, of information typically tends to be, you know, very selective. It, nowadays, it may be Twitter to some extent, and that's that's good and bad, right? There's really good stuff. There's lots of lots of good stuff. But I think when, when it comes to someone like you, uh, you have the opportunity to talk to a lot of the smartest minds out there as we do too. So it's always good to kind of, you know, build a a a viewpoint, uh, having listened to lots of different people as opposed to just one or two sources. So I think that's one of the great benefits here. But uh, David, let's just get right into it. I'm going to bring up uh, uh, some slides that you brought along. This is uh, also so you guys have a, a visual reference point. But I mean, I guess just to start off to kick you off in the right direction, I think you and I are both in agreement that we will be in somewhat of a higher inflationary environment for the next number of years. And we can define that a bit more than we've had for the past, you know, 30 or so years after the Cold War, uh, you know, China being admitted to the, the, the WTO and so on and so forth. This is a wild time to be alive. I, I was talking to my kids about it the other day. They've seen more crazy things in their short lifespan than, yeah. than I had prior pandemics, inflation, and all types of just anarchy. And one of the things that, that people have to really grip around is the idea that we've got two wildly powerful forces, financial excess and innovation, and they're effectively colliding at the same time. And that really changes the game a bit from an asset allocation perspective. So we'll start with the financial excess. We'll start with the ugly and then, then one with the nice. Um, you want to increase the money supply by nearly 50% in a short period of time? Well, bad things are going to happen. You want to persistently overspend, borrow from the future to finance today. Well, eventually, right, what you're going to end up with is, is, is this situation where financial excess is effectively going to drive higher inflation, slower growth, instability. That, that, that's, that's the broad-based setup. That, that's unfortunately where we're at. The chart that you have here, it really just speaks to a very, very simple idea that people are having a really hard time with. Um, that's that this time is probably not different, right? That, that's what effectively it's saying. Inflation has a way of sticking around. We're not saying that we're in some type of 70s type of setup where you're going to get, you know, double digit inflation for a decade. That's not what we're talking about. But okay. this chart's effectively showing once you pierce above 5%, how long does it take for you to get to 2% or lower? And if you look at historical inflation regimes, it takes over a decade because inflation is a very powerful force. And once it, once it becomes embedded in the system, it has a way of lasting for a long time. So 
when people say, well, inflation is going to fall to 2%, it's going to stay there. Well, what they're saying is this time is different. And whenever people start saying this time is different, you should start getting very nervous. <laughs> you should run, right? I, I agree. Two, two, two quick questions on this. Or, I mean, a question that I think people might think of at this point is, well, Dave, we're already at 3% core or 3.2, whatever it was, and 2.5% uh, two, two sudden headline. Why can't we get to 2 I know this this is this will get us in the longer conversation, but some people are thinking we're there and we're just going to stay here now. What is we'll go into more detail, but like what is the long and short of in, in terms of your view so we can kind of get a bit of a preview? If I was a salesman and I were to come to you and sell you that today is just going to look like yesterday and, and, and what you've experienced over over your financial investing career is the status quo. And that's exactly what it's going to be like. Well, that's a very easy sale. And that's effectively what the no inflation, low inflation is because the people that are investing today, we're not managing money in the 1970s, right? You would be extraordinarily old. I actually met one person and, and they were in, in their late 90s that was doing that. Otherwise, waiting in line in, in your V8 GTO for gas does not count as managing money um, in the 1970s, right? So if you were a child then in the 1970s, that does not make you an expert on inflation. That means you were a child when we had inflation. You have to study periods of inflation. Now, when you look at periods of inflation, what you see is that pocket of inflation, pocket of disinflation, or even pocket of deflation. That's the way it looks. You get inflation comes in waves. Burst of inflation, pocket of disinflation. We are in a disinflationary pocket. Now, here's something else. We can, if, if the economy rolls over in a material way, which is not what we're saying, but if it does, right? This is all about probabilities. If it does, well, guess what? You can go negative on CPI. And you could still be in an inflationary cycle. It just means that you're in one of these disinflationary pockets. So as the ugliness of inflation becomes more and more apparent, right? That's what we have right now, the, the, the ugly time, right? Remember in the beginning of inflation, everything's a party. Everything goes up. It's, it's, a, it's an all everything bubble, right? When inflation happens. Um, anybody that owns anything looks smart. I literally bought a boat. I bought a new boat in 2020. It was worth more a year later. That, that you could buy a used car and have ha and made money off it. That does not make you a genius. That's just what happens when inflation, ri rising tides of salt all boats, and that's effectively what happened. Now we're in this disinflationary pocket. Now expectation would be is that the Fed's going to lower rates when they do that, um, and they ease up on monetary policy. What they're going to do is they're going to stoke the inflationary flames. And what 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 people should be worried about the risk is is that you get another pocket of inflation. Now we're not talking ten percent, right? We're talking about going between, you know, two, five, two, five, an average rate of inflation, three to five, right? That, that, that's what we're talking about. And if we're talking about an average rate of inflation material above 2%, call it three to 5%, well, that changes a lot for asset allocation. Your, your disinflationary asset allocation uh, isn't going to work as well. And the assets that you've shunned for so long because we've been in this disinflationary period, well, they're going to do a lot better. And, and that's that's the idea that we're trying to people to, to, people to get their open minds open to. Because if that happens, you've got to be prepared. To, 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 um, to that point, just so I don't forget it, I think it's probably a, a fair point to bring up at this, at this juncture here in the conversation. I've had people say, well, Serge, we had, you know, the 08, 09 finance, the GFC, as you and I know it, right? The great financial crisis. I traded right through that as well. Uh, at Mothership JP Morgan, and I can tell you everyone was screaming about inflation then. I think what people have to understand is that when we print money, it goes directly on the bank balance sheets. That's a different situation than writing checks that we had during COVID. And there's a lot to unpack here. I don't think we're going to fit everything in, but I'm trying to explain to people that, you know, where the money goes when we, when we, when we, when we, when we basically print money does matter. In terms of the, the 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 pressure it has on inflation as well, just because of a side point. I don't know if you have any views on that, but I I'm trying to fit it in somewhere here, so at least we bring it up. If you go out and print a trillion dollars, you bury a hole in your backyard and you put it there, you're not going to get inflation. You're going to get an increase in the money supply, and you're not going to get inflation. You print all that money and then you give it out to consumers, well, they're going to spend. It. Exactly. Most, most most people are not wealthy. Most people need that money, and most people are going to put that money to work in the best use for them, and they're going to consume. And that's the big difference, right? You, you give money to a rich person, they're going to invest it. You give money to somebody that needs, needs it, well, they're going to spend it. And that's the difference. 
Now, now the problem is, is that, right, we passed that Rubicon, we passed the debt Rubicon. Now we, we're in a situation where we don't have a lot of options from a debt perspective. Um, interest rates are higher because of this, although they're still falling, they're still high given the amount of debt load. So we're in this really unfortunate situation that leads to instability, instability in the, in the form of higher inflation, slower growth, uh, more economic malaise, more need for assets with scarcity in your portfolio. Yeah, and I want to get to that because that's that's really, I think, the, the, the meat of it all. But just my sort of side point there with that previous question, thank you for answering it so, I guess, eloquently, um, is, you know, again, as you said before, people tend to think it's different this time. So, storage, we've had money printing before and it didn't lead to inflation. I just want to quickly address that, right? It is, it just depends exactly where the money is being put. But I don't know if you're ready for it, but let's talk asset allocation or kind of some of the things that could benefit uh, that we might be able to invest in and park some money in during a higher inflation environment as opposed to a disinflation environment that we've had for a long period of time. Yeah, so during periods of financial excess, you want to buy assets with scarcity. It's it's really that simple. You you when when money is constantly being devalued and fiat currencies are being devalued, you want to buy assets with scarcity. Now, if we go to the next chart, the ultimate asset to invest in during this period is gold. We think gold bullion is the ultimate asset for store value. There's other assets as well that I would complement it with. I wouldn't just buy gold, right? I would buy a diversified basket of real assets. That would include even digital assets like Bitcoin, but commodities, real assets, um, even even financial real assets. Think about REITs, yes. infrastructure, et cetera. But gold is the ultimate store of value asset. We, we've been calling for a, a gold bull market for some time now um, and actually getting the timing really, really good. And, and why is that? Gold typically works as the inflation cycle matures. Why, why is that? Because again, like I said before, when inflation first hits, that's the party because that's when everything is going up. If you don't expect inflation, so let's go back in time, let's jump in our time machine a little bit. We were first told we weren't gonna get inflation for the reasons that you mentioned before. Oh wait, we printed a lot of money, it didn't work its way into the system, et cetera. But largely we were told we weren't gonna get inflation. So you don't have a problem to solve, right? Gold solves a problem for you. You didn't have a, a problem to solve. And then we got inflation, we were told it was going to be mild and temporary. We still don't have a problem to solve, right? Because we, we only have a mild temporary inflation problem at the time. And then inflation becomes extreme. But you're told, well, hold on a second. I don't have a problem to solve because the government's going to fix it for me, right? The Powell comes out, central bankers globally. We're going to fix the problem for you. So again, Big Brother's going to solve my problem for me. Again, I don't have a problem to solve. It's going to solve correct. And now you're years later and your spending power continues to fall. And those shallow words become worth less and less and less. And you start saying to yourself, hold on a second. Maybe I actually have to protect myself, right? Maybe I have to do something for myself to protect my assets and protect my financial stability as I age, protect my family. And that's where gold comes in. Gold is the ultimate store of value asset. That's why in the beginning of the inflation cycle, listen, gold rallies with their assets. And that's what you saw in the 1970s. You're seeing gold and commodities both rally once inflation rallied. And then look at the second half of, of um, the 1970s inflation cycle. Gold absolutely rips it because people are sick and tired of their spending power going down. They're sick of being, of being told that they don't have a problem and this problem will self-correct and it's going to go away. And they seek out gold. Well, guess what? Central banks globally have been significantly increasing their exposure to gold. That's happening, right? And they're talking about doing more of it. Gold's finally rallying. This is year to date, one year, two year, and three years. That's gold versus the SP 500 and Bloomberg. Investors really aren't allocating to gold right now, but guess what? They're gonna start looking at it, looking at the rest of their portfolio and say, hold on a second, maybe I should own that. As that happened, as retail investors, as institutional investors really start to catch up to where central banks have been, right? Expectation is that this gold market goes a lot higher. There's a lot of people bullish on gold, but probably a lot more bullish than they are. I'm not a gold bug. I don't always jump up and down and say, now's the time to buy gold, right? Gold bugs love gold no matter what the weather is. They think it's time to buy gold. That, yeah. That's not where we are. I can invest across any asset class. I don't have to go to gold. But I'm telling you from our perspective, we think gold, if, if I had to pick one asset, I'm going to go with gold right now because okay. it's, it's, it's a hedge against the exact problems we're dealing with right now. I'm glad you, A, bring it up that 
uh, that you're not a gold bug, because I'm not either. I did make this my lordship position, I think, la like 12, 13 months ago at this point. And that's not a, a victory lap here at all. I'm just saying, like, we did make that call. But also, I like the fact that, you know, you, you have the opportunity, as you mentioned in the introduction, to, in in to invest in other things, whatever you think's you think might be best. This is a tremendous chart. Now we've talked about gold and again, just kind of staying in the line of not being gold bugs. What are some other, maybe give us a couple other ideas of things that tend to do well during the higher inflation environment and maybe some things that don't do so well. Yeah, so so when, when you think about inflation, you wanna to go to assets with scarcity. You don't wanna just buy gold. So gold, big piece, big piece of your real asset bucket in our opinion, but there's other assets as well. So when I think about inflation periods, I think about three types of assets. The first financial assets, I'm thinking about gold bullion. I'm also thinking about Bitcoin. I think that Bitcoin has a piece within there. A lot of people view it as digital gold. I'm not going to go as far as call it digital gold, but I will say that it has some characteristics that I like, and I think some diversification benefits that I like. So if I would own a lot of gold and a very small amount of Bitcoin, the volatility allows you to do that. So I think that all that belongs in your financial real asset component. Second, resource assets. People should own commodities and people should own the companies that benefit from higher commodity prices. People pulling commodities, refining, sourcing, distributing commodities. That's the second. The third is, is, is um, income generating real assets. I'm talking about uh, real estate, I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about MLPs. These are the type of assets, real assets that actually yield off it. So those are the three types of assets that I want people to own within their portfolio to diversify their other exposure. Perfect. I mean, couldn't have said it any better, but again, it's, it's just very, it's great to be able to have this conversation so we can get people to hear this from other, other perspectives as well, or other, other, uh, other people out there. Where, where, where are some of the things that you would say are not as interesting to invest? You know, not necessarily have to be outright short, but maybe just like underweight kind of thing. What falls into that category? Because I think that's where the rubber meets the road here. When I look at the asset allocation, I, I, I see three segments in the portfolio. And, and I don't want to be, I don't want to miss the other part that I said before, uh, which is innovation. Because in, we're at a very, very interesting time in innovation. And these things have to merge together, in, in my opinion. Um, so let me just hit on that really quickly because it ties into all this, how I think sure. about the asset classes. AI is a general purpose technology. Other examples of general purpose technology, the wheel, the steam engine, electricity, computer, internet, general purpose technologies, especially in this day and age, like the internet did, have the ability to drive productivity, to drive economic growth. Now it's gonna take some time for that to happen, but the internet came out, made a lot of big promises, in my opinion, completely over delivered. The world has changed, billions of people are better off for it, things are more productive, we got a lot of growth out of that, and we think AI is going to do the same thing. So I'm bullish on on stocks. I'm bullish on just broad-based growth stocks in general. Over the long run, I think three to five years out, you're going to be a lot higher. So I like stocks. Um, I like real assets. Now, when I have stocks, bonds, real assets together, I'm excited about stocks. I'm excited about real assets. Bonds, probably not a lot, right? So, so not anti-fixed income because you're getting higher yields now but it's the less attractive place. I would rather own gold than fixed income. I would own other real assets broadly than fixed income. So when I look at it, I'm gonna fund my fix, my real asset allocation as much for my fixed income as I can while keeping my risk tolerance in line. So when I think about this, I like equities, I like real assets and I like fixed income lease. I'm not saying I'm bearish on fixed income, but this is a capital allocation discussion. It's how do I make the most money while keeping my risk contained? And it's really about it. it it's it's a uh, how much can I take and meet my reach my, meet, uh, reach my objectives. So I want people to own at least ten percent of real assets. That that that's where I'm at. Five to ten percent, call it that, um, yep. to real assets depending on their risk tolerance. Um, I want them to take as much of it from fixed income as they can while maintaining their risk tolerance, which means they're probably going to have to fund some of it from equities as well. But that's the way that I think about it. Yeah, and I think that's an important point, right? So, I mean, I, I guess there's, I guess there's two steps here. Uh, one of them, I think, is the timing. Um, this is more of an asset allocation conversation as opposed to a trading conversation, which is really important to understand. So, you know, you talk about you know high growth AI kind of stuff. 
That doesn't mean we have to chase those at every high. Uh, they can have drawdowns. They can have huge drawdowns, right? But you're talking about from an allocation perspective. The second point here, I think it's really important is, you know, you're talking about adding in other stuff. When we look at people's portfolios, when we survey, most people have none of this allocation that we just talked about. They only have the last bit we just talked about, which is basically high tech growth. I'm not talking about everyone, obviously, but the vast bit of self-directed investors, particularly, have very little exposure there, right? So I think that's important because someone might tune in here and say, okay, well, he did say, <laughs> they did say AI and that's, and I got that, but I got none of the other stuff. I'm good. No, you're not good, right? At least I think you and I would agree on that. There has to be that other component. That's really important. And, and I would argue that might come with a lot less volatility, by the way, than the AI stuff as well. But that's another thing, uh, you know, that I, that I, 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 I'd like to talk to people over time as well. Can we go to the last chart that I have? Please. I think it drives us home. Yep. The world before inflation was what you saw on the left, where you had negative correlations between stocks and bonds. And then the post-inflation is, well, your stocks and bonds being attacked by the same force, which is inflation. Um, inflation still not below 2%. And even if it falls below 2%, we don't think it stays there, right? That That's, that's our view, right? We could be wrong. We've been wrong before. Um, but this is a conversation about risk, right? Risk management. Um, and when you look at that, well, you see a, a positive correlation between stocks and bonds, which means that your asset allocation is not performing as it has historically because the risk and return attributes, the environment has changed where one is such where the assets are now behaving different. Now you're really left with a very, very simple question. Do you know with absolute certainty that inflation is going to go away and stay there? And if anybody can know that, well, then they guess what? Then they can come or do you also know that financial excess will not continue down this path and we will not end up with financial instability? Well, if you know that answer with absolute certainty, well, then you could avoid real assets. But if you're open to the idea that we're right, if you're open to the idea that this is a risk in your portfolio, how could you not diversify? At the end of the day, if you find yourself if you find yourself arguing against diversification, that's very, you have a very, very weak footing. So I, I would suggest to people, be open to opposing views, be open to the idea that, that, that you don't know everything, that you can be wrong. And that's why you diversify. So owning less than 5% in real assets should make people wildly uncomfortable in our opinion. Um, I'm also not advocating for 50%. Um, but what we're really saying is just spread the peanut butter around a little bit, be diversified. We're in a really wild time and wild things are happening and you should be prepared for all different financial situations. And that's really kind of our, our, our part of yeah. people. Well, and we live at least from my point of view here, this is my, I'm not putting words in your mouth, obviously this is my point of view. From what we're seeing also, it's just, you know, again, a lot of gambling attitude right now, putting it on red, putting it in a couple of those, uh, you know, uh, names that we all know, and they might be great companies. They are great companies, but with no diversification, even th for, diversification, as far as what we can see in our client conversations has become in many ways a, a four letter, a curse word, basically. And, um, and I think, uh, and I think that is, uh, that is important to understand diversification here into other things into the, the real assets part that you said before, certainly agree with that. And maybe on this slide, in case maybe to kind of summarize it. Uh, as in sort of my words, you know, the risk parity trade is is, is a kind of off the table, at least less uh, interesting than it was before with the, the inverse correlation of stocks and bonds. Doesn't mean we don't want to buy fixed income or, or any of it. I mean, we had great environment here for a while to buy, to pick up yields. Of course, no one cared <laughs> because we had shiny objects elsewhere. But um, but yeah, so any final thoughts on this, David? This has been tremendously uh, uh valuable i think for our listeners and certainly for myself as well yeah i would just i would probably wrap it up with just to make it more actionable for people one of the the solutions that we manage is the vanek inflation allocation etf and the whole reason why this this strategy is in existence is to help people solve this problem because at the end of the day investing in real assets is is, is new for a lot of people so they're, they're left with many questions which real assets do i own how do I invest across the real assets? And when do I adjust that allocation? So those three questions, the what, when, and how, start to become a problem for people because they're like, well, I get it. Now you just told me five to 10% in real assets, but what does that mean? Do I just buy gold? Do I just buy this? And that's why that's there. It, it's a diversified allocation to inflation fighting assets. We talked before, what are those right assets? Financial assets, gold bullion, 
um, resource assets, commodities, natural resource equities, income generating real assets, REITs, infrastructure, MLPs. Put all those together, um, and that's effectively what you have. It's helpful with the what, what real assets to invest in, um, how, right? How do you allocate, right? We've got a lot of gold right now, um, right? That That's a, we're almost it's 27, 28% gold right now. So lots of gold. Um, and we're going to adjust those allocations over time based off of our views on how things are unfolding in our quantitative process. So I just wanted to leave people with that as well. Uh, this has been a fun conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you, David. And the, the ticker symbol for that is R-A-A-X. David, great pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, Vanek.com is the website. Thank you so much, David, and hope you guys found this helpful as well. Thank you.